On the 4th of August 1914, Australia entered World War I on the side of the British Empire. It was the first global war and the first to feature machinery as well as men. Tanks, aircraft, new heavy and destructive artillery, machine guns and gas. Frightening new innovations whose success was written in blood. By the time the war ended in 1919, 60,000 of the 416,000 Australians who served were dead and some 156,000 had been wounded. A casualty rate of almost 55%. The makeshift forged by the diggers in the trenches and the sacrifices they made in battle was dubbed the Anzac Spirit. It became the guiding light of our young nation, which only came into being the decade before. While the monuments and the marches recall the deeds of those men who served, much less attention has been paid to the some 3,000 civilian nurses who also served. 25 were killed and 388 were decorated, with eight receiving the military medal. I think they deserve to stand up there on the monuments with the Anzacs because they had to fight two battles they had to look after the young men who had been destroyed or near destroyed by this machine. <laughs> Seeing the chest wounds the abdominal wounds, the amputations, uh, the shock, seeing the gasping victims of gas attacks and so on. These women didn't crack. They also had to deal with the fact that there were many who said, well, they shouldn't be doing that. This isn't the place for women, you know. Orderlies, male orderlies, are far more important to the nursing of the wounded. Orderly? Can I get some clean bandages? Bugger off. Nurses only get in the way. The attitude towards nurses, military nurses, had not altered since the days of Florence Nightingale. But to our wounded servicemen on the front line, the nurses in their white aprons and veils appeared to them as angels. They were the angels of the battlefield. Amongst the angels who served with distinction were Nellie Maurice and Catherine Porter, both from New South Wales. Two young women representing the generations who will help keep the Anzac spirit alive for the next hundred years have volunteered to go on a journey of discovery back to the past. Hi, I'm Bethany. I'm a journalism student at the University of Wollongong and I come from Bow, which is in the Southern Highlands, just two hours south of Sydney. Hi, my name's Ashley. I'm 21. I study education and history and I live in Sydney. I think this could be a really interesting journey back into the past. I'm excited to find out about Sister Nellie Maurice and what she did and why she volunteered. It actually makes me wonder if I would have been brave enough to go to war. My great-grandfather, Reginald Francis McCrory, was a stretcher bearer during World War I. Although I never met him, my grandmother told us lots about him and it made me realise how horrible it would have been then. I feel I should know more about it because it was those actions that defined who we are as Australians and the values that we hold dear. I'm really looking forward to finding out more about Kitty Porter and her service during World War I.
With the help of records from the local historical society, I found her birth certificate. Nellie Maurice, born March 31st, 1881, right here in Sutton Forest in the Southern Highlands. Having a strange name in a small town does make it a little bit easier to find relatives. And I think I've found one living in the Barrel area and I'm off to meet her now. Mab's row is a relative of Nellie's and we've arranged to meet with her at a place called Ealing Forest, which is actually just a little bit out of town. Hi, you must be Mab. And you're Bethany. Yeah. It's lovely to yeah, meet you. you too. Did you have a lovely ride? Yeah, it was good. It was great, actually. Well, this is uh, Marie's ancestral home yeah. where Nellie was born. Well, how are you actually related to Nellie? Nellie was actually my grandfather's cousin. Ealing Forest was established by Nellie's grandfather, John Maurice, who emigrated to Australia as a free settler in the 1830s. He had 12 children, including Nellie's father, David. Now, David had 11 children, including Nellie. Nellie was a seventh child, and David inherited Ealing Forest. And so they were all in here at one time. They were? So it must be a pretty big house. Well, 11 children yeah. is a lot. <laughs> Should we have a look? We'd love to. Yes. I've just brought some photos to yeah. show you. This is John Maurice, mm -hmm. the original owner, and he married Jane Osborne, another well-known family. Mm -hmm. They look like they did quite well for themselves. Like, even just the way John's dressed up here, he looks quite um, prestigious. And yes. Yeah. In his time, he was a magistrate, yeah. and he was... Um, a member of the council at Berrimah. John was very involved and very interested in furthering education because it was a way to, to lift the people. And he was involved in the establishment of schools. Wow. Even one here at Ealing Right, Forest. yeah. Do you think we could go have a look at that? Let's. Yeah? Let's okay. go. <laughs> Were they educated with other local kids from the area? Oh, yes. And at one stage it was even known as um, Ealing Forest Public School. Really? It looks, it looks so small, though. Oh, yes, but in 1857, there were 49 children in there. 49. Oh, wow. And so would Nellie have gone to school here? We think so. Possibly with a combination of tutors and governesses and the master at the time. Just looking at the way that Nellie was brought up and her education, what kind of person would you say that Nellie actually was? Well, when you think of her parents and her grandparents, yeah. I think she would have been brought up with a very a strong sense of values and knowing what was right and wrong. Yeah. Do you think that's maybe why she chose to go into nursing? Possibly. Mm. I think you need to talk to Jeremy Graham. I have some photographs and some other information about Auntie Nell. Yeah, so I've been hearing a lot about the Maurice family and all the different relatives, but where do you actually fit in? On the family tree here, mm -hmm. um, you'll find Auntie Nell, uh, born in 1881, mm -hmm. coming down to my mum, born in 1926, right. and then me here in 1957. Yeah, OK. Yeah, oh, Auntie Nell was my great aunt. Um, so your mum actually knew Nellie then? Very much so. Yeah. Um, in fact, mum spent um, quite a few of her teenage years uh, living with Auntie yeah. Nell in Chatswood while she completed her secondary education. Yeah. There are some photos of mum here, some of them when she was only very young, and yeah. then around the age of 20, after she'd started a nursing training, then as a bride, and then with my older sister Penny, who so also became a both nurse. Both became nurses. Mm, largely, it yeah. was Nell's influence. So what was actually um, Nellie like back then? Her entry in the Australian Dictionary of Biography says, photographs her in a military nurse's uniform showed her to be a tall woman, direct mm. and forward-looking, with a hint of the smile of a controlled and confident person. Yeah, that gives me a really good picture of... The kind of person that she was. Yeah. yeah. But from what mum and other relatives uh, told me about her, um, she was very strong-willed, yeah. very independent, very single-minded. Um, she came from good stock, as you know, yeah. and was apparently quite snobby. Oh, really? Yeah. Because she was, she was her family was quite well-respected in the community. Yes. And yeah. yes, exactly. Okay. So Nell was very aware of her family's uh, standing. So... You know, if she if she did come from such a, a good background, why volunteer to be a nurse when, I mean, she could have lived there for the rest of her life? 
Well, you've got to consider too what life was like 100 years ago. Yeah. Then it was traditional that the property would usually be left um, to the eldest son. Okay. So um, Nell could have stayed yeah. um, but probably have ended up being her parents' carer. Yeah, well. um, if she'd left, she might have uh, chosen to be um, a governess, mm. maybe a teacher um, or maybe even somebody's housekeeper. I guess I hadn't I hadn't really thought about it like that as, at all. But it makes a lot of sense that nursing would have given her an op- opportunity to travel and... In a lot of ways, I think Auntie Nell was a feminist. Really? Mm, what very, makes you very say much that? So. Only because she was, um, she was single-minded. Yeah. Um, she didn't... Uh, she didn't copy anybody. Yeah. She uh, she had her own mind and her own uh, vision yeah. of of what she wanted to do, mm. of of the life that she wanted to live. I began my search for Kitty Porter at the local library. Thank you, Jane, for letting me come and see you. This is really exciting. What would you recommend to start? You're looking into the biography of a nurse, is that right? Yeah, so her name's Kitty Porter. Kitty Porter. Yeah. What do you know about her? She was a war nurse in Anzac. Um, Right, that's a really good starting (laughs) point. Well, this is a good place to start then. We can also tell from this that Mm -hmm. her father's name was Jay Porter, so we're looking at a John or a James, Mm. and she was born, or at least the family came from East Milton, South Coast, New South Wales. The earliest earliest birth we can see is John in 1871 at Ulladulla, and we've got Alice. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've got a, a Thomas and a William, a Mary, obviously named after the mother. Yes. And Elizabeth, then comes Catherine. So she's a fair way down the picking yeah, order. Yeah, she's a little bit younger. A little bit younger. And we've got a Charles after her. But we've also got a William and an Anne. We've got a Jane and we've got a Henry and we have a Stephen. A Stephen. So from 1871 to 1895, We've got, I think, 13 children and uh, over... a big family. (laughs) That'd be great. Would I be able to come down? Fantastic. Having discovered that Kitty came from Milton, I got in touch with the local historical society and arranged a trip to the New South Wales south coast. Noel Turnbull, who has spent all his life in Milton and is actually related to Kitty. I'm hoping he can tell me more about the Porter family and her early years. Hi, Noel. My name's Ashley. Hello, Ashley. How are you? So, um, where exactly are we? Today we're we're at a place called the Duck Hole, which was the original home of Nurse Kitty Porter. Was, was that her actual cottage? This is not the cottage where she was in. The original cottage was over the creek. It was a timber slab home. The property was called the Duck Hole because of the sinkhole in the middle of the billabong that could actually drag ducks and unsuspecting children down into its dark depths. I also learned that there were still porters living in Milton. You're my first real connection with the Kitty and Kitty's family. So where did the Porter family originate from? My grandfather was uh, from Liverpool in England and um, he came out to Australia as a free settler and um, with the purpose of helping his cousin, John Morgan Jr, to build the Lice House at uh, Geelong. Upon arriving at um, uh, Melbourne, he found that uh, there were the gold rush had hit. Oh wow, okay, we're going right back. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> he found that he was not suited for for gold digging. So he uh, made his way to Milton. Okay, and did Milton he start as a 
as a farmer or as a labourer of sorts. He was a steroid. And uh, he was also... I don't think I've heard of that word. <laughs> <laughs> also a carpenter, uh, but he did also did stonemasonry. So he found work quite easily down here. So how did he meet your grandmother? My grandmother, uh, Mary Guthrie, came from Ireland. Thirteen children that they raised on this lovely place. Oh, OK. <laughs> Mary Guthrie's immigration record listed her as an Irish Catholic, and I hoped that the local church might have some family records. Here I've got the very first parish baptism register, Melton Catholic Church. And oh, wow, OK. <laughs> unfortunately, Kitty was born four years before the church was built, so her oh, records aren't okay. actually in here. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, I found a few of her siblings' records are in here. Yeah. Have a look here. This one, William Edward, who was born on the 26th of June and the yeah. first parish priest of Milton baptised him, Father James, James O'Doherty. Right. Over here we have um, Edna, a yeah. sister. She was born on the 10th of February, 1891. Okay, right. Yeah, there's not many years difference between them all. I don't know. No, children. There, there were many, many children yeah. in the family. Harold Henry Porter, 19th of May, 1893. I believe you've met Henry. This is Henry's father. Oh, on. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Being um, part of a large family, the church was very central to their life. Yeah, okay. And living out, they lived out the, the Bush Affair way. Yeah, yeah, out in Duck Hole, so it was quite a while away. So church, when they came to church on Sundays, it was it's integral to their spiritual life as well as their social life. So okay. Kitty, I'm sure, would have spent a fair bit of time and quite possibly sitting where you and I are now. Milton is a charming and historic town with many of the original buildings dating back to the mid-19th century. One in particular has a very strong physical and emotional connection to the Porter family. Now standing outside the Milton Town Hall, which was built in 1871 yep. by Kitty Porter's father, Mr John Porter. Oh, who, wow, OK. Who was a uh, master mason stone mason and a carpenter, and he was the one who sort of built all this in this magnificent building. Mm. You can see by the design and the workmanship there, he truly was a craftsman. Yeah, very, yeah. very talented, yes. Do you think that this is possibly where John Porter met Mary and possibly were made reason to why he stayed it in could, It could well be. We also visited the school Kitty attended and learned about the sacrifices her generation made during World War I. There's listed all of the 91 people who uh, served, who left the school and served at the Great War 1914, 1919. Mm. And importantly, there's one female on there, which is Nurse Kitty Porter. She also attended out. There was nine of those people who did not return to the Australian shores. That's, that's very significant. That's a 10% of the whole population that left. It, it, it is. It's a huge, especially in a small community those days. I do have to ask, what does the RRC stand for? The RRC stands for Royal Red Cross, but anyway, we'll tell you more about that later. OK. <laughs> OK. Significantly, Kitty's service is also commemorated on the town's war memorial. And including in there was Nurse Kitty Porter, who was the only female who was listed on this war memorial in the district. Really? Yes, it's Wow, yeah. fabulous. Yeah. My trip to Milton gave me a great insight into Kitty's early years, but I really wanted to know what she did to earn that Royal Red Cross. find out where Nellie trained to be a nurse. So I went along to Sydney's Royal Prince Alfred Hospital to meet historian Scott Andrews. Hi Scott, how are you? Hi, yes, nice to meet you. You too. Welcome yeah. to the nurses' home. So is this where Nellie and other nurses would have stayed? Yep, yeah, they trained four years and they lived in residence here. Wow. Yeah, come on, let's have yeah, a look. I'd love to. 
If Jeremy was right, then nursing was an escape from a life that offered few choices for a woman with an independent mind. So up here, we've got the northeast aspect of the nurse's site, 1992. It's huge. And this one here is, we think about 1905, three nurses in D block. That's an incredible photo, look at that. And look at what they're wearing as well, like their dresses and their, um, I can see some scissors on this one. Just, if you look here, you'll yeah. see the original nurse's sitting room. And then obviously at some point it was used as a dining room as well. Yeah. Wow. Nursing offered Nellie the chance to have a career that would test her intellect That's such a good point. And, um, and allow her to advance according to her ability. Could you run me through um, the kind of training that the nurses would have received here? Yeah, um, during Nellie's time, it was really a significant leap forward because mm. they were saying to undergo general science training for the first time, um, anatomy, physiology and especially hygiene, mm. something important to consider because... In this time, you know, for the first time, we're starting to survive from things that traditionally might have killed us. Mm. Okay, Beth, so what we've got here is the RPA record of service, and on page 150, ah. Nellie Constance Maurice, mm. aged 22 years and uh, 1903. Oh, OK, so that's when she started her training. Yeah, that's right. that's right. And it says here, has not had any previous employment. So nothing before. Wow. So I wonder what she did from when she finished school up until she was, you know, 22, 22. years old. There's a really interesting bit at the top here, February 27th. Miss Morris seems very interested, it's very difficult to read, <laughs> very interested in her work and she promises to make a satisfactory nurse after a course of training. Right, so they would have seen a lot of potential in her, I guess. And that shows her education being a bit up and a bit down. I mean, she's got uh, fails, she's got passes with credit. <laughs> there are some interesting points through here. There's a nice little cheeky point over here. Um, specials day out breaks the rules occasionally. <laughs> it's nice seeing sort of a different side of Nellie and, and I guess seeing that she's a little bit rebellious. And with her marks as well, I mean, it makes me wonder whether the work was really that hard. She does end up here. It says past deferred examination, four years did get granted. Looks mm. very good, exam with credit. Oh, so she really applied herself in the end, didn't she? Came out very successful. Did definitely then go on and work in a private hospital. Nelly fulfilled the promise the matron saw in her by returning to RPA in 1912 as acting sister in charge of the Alexandria and Roberts wards. Seeking a meaningful profession, a young Kitty Porter left Milton and came to Sydney Hospital to train as a nurse. Was Sydney Hospital a prestigious hospital to learn or to be trained as a nurse? Oh, most certainly, because we were the oldest and still are the oldest hospital in Australia. So we date from 1788 with the first fleet's invasion mm -hmm. of Sydney Hospital in Lower Droad Street. Do come into the public face of the matrons. This was their office. Have a look at the um, matrons in those photos. This Rose Creel that could be of interest to you because of the connection with the Porter family. Kitty um, was influenced by her to come and train here, I believe, through family history, I've heard. Oh, really? So I have heard so. Wow. Oh, OK, right, right. Now, just have a look at this matron's register here. Here enters the great mystery mm -hmm. and confusion because we had three porter ladies unrelated oh, okay. on the staff training here. But of the three, one didn't complete her training and two did. So to unravel all this has been almost near impossible. Mm -hmm. So they both went by the name Catherine Porter. Except one's got often used as Lawrence. Mm -hmm. Then they interchange their names from Kate, both using Kate, or both using their full name, Catherine. Mm -hmm. You see here? And what is the name of the nurse? Catherine M. Porter. OK. We've got Catherine Porter, brackets, Lawrence. Right. Now, that's your girl? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
the matrons kept these matrons registers of all the nurses. Mm -hmm. But they did record progressively, or by hand naturally, uh, what your process through the training period was like. And just have a look at here, because on point four, the following candidates have completed their trial period fairly satisfactorily and are anxious to remain. So you did one year of probationary training. Kate A. Porter, brackets, Lawrence. So that's your lady. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But have a look at the nut, what she's got there in pencil. See down above her name? Mm, What's it say? It's just saying February 08. 08. Now, that mm. means she must have been here training as a probationer for two years. Two years, wow. As it says there, fairly, fairly satisfactory. satisfactory. Why yeah. did she do that? It's because someone on the family was ill and she returned to the country, which quite okay. often happened. The girl would ask the matron, may I have leave? Right. Now, up here on the same page, look at here, we've got Catherine Porter Brackets, Lawrence, list of graduates of the training school. That's 1912. Yeah, Kate Porter. So the, our nurses were trained in trauma and injury mm. and horrible, stressful situations. Now, I'm not saying that the girls that were Sydney Hospital trained were prepared, actually, for the hideous warfare in the First World War. I mm. won't say that at all. Mm. But it did help them. You must always remember it was Nellie Gould who was appointed by the government to set up the nurses' training for those that were enlisting in the Boer War and in the First War. Mm -hmm. So that it was part of really the psyche for these girls that if there was a war, they would serve. I've come to Berrima to see Mabs again. There's an exhibition she'd like me to see. Well, this exhibition mm. is our contribution to the centenary of World War One. Maybe tell me a little bit about what you have, what you have in this exhibition. So, for a number of years, I've been collecting and gathering up all the 1,200 Southern Highlanders who served during World War One. Mm. And 1,200 is quite a large number. Was the population small at that time as well? Fairly, eight to 10,000 probably in 1914. So that would have been significant so then? Possibly around 10% um, of the local population. Mm. A lot of country boys thought they were going to get some sort of lovely adventure. Yeah. Um, it was an opportunity to travel overseas yeah. that they might never have otherwise had. Mm. And none of them could have foreseen what was ahead. I understand you're here to do a little bit about Nellie Maurice. Yes, so nice. why don't we go over and see what we can find about the Maurice family? Here we are. Wow, look at this. It's a lovely room. So when I look at all this, I can see there's about nine Maurices. Were they all related? Well, there were 13 cousins who went all together. Four of her brothers went as well as herself. That's incredible. And they all served at the same, like, at the same time. Often all the sons in a family might have enlisted and gone away, and on occasions all of those sons perished. There's Nellie there. Yes, she enlisted very early in the war. Mm -hmm in November, the 24th of November, and on the 28th she was on board ship and on her way. Uh, she went on a troop transport, the Kayara, which was probably had about a 1,000 troops on board. It would have been yeah, quite an experience for her, I imagine. Four days. Why was that? Why was there such a quick turnaround between enlisting and then...? Nearly as early as 1910 had joined the Australian Army Nursing Service designed to create a pool of civilian nurses that would be ready to go to war. She went to Egypt. Yeah, that was where all the troops went and they trained, the troops were training in Egypt before they went off, obviously went off to Gallipoli. Okay, so here in the display case, you can see some of the artefacts Mm. Well, some of the things that Nellie sent home. Got some really nice photos of Nellie down here as well. Yes, mm. Egypt was 
for the nurses, I think, um, a relatively fun time. Lovely photos of them at the Sphinx and mm. pyramids, that seemed to be obligatory. Mm. So I think they had a fairly lovely time yeah. in Egypt. Certainly they had no idea of what was to come. Yeah. Oh, wow. So is this all the Maurice family? All across the tops, Maurice. And then we go into the Osbournes who married the Maurices. Yeah. And how long did it take you to organise all of this? About 30 years, give or take a couple of years. 30 years. That's longer than I've even been alive. Of course, yes. <laughs> yes. So I see you've got some really nice photos of Nellie here. Were they taken by Nellie? Because I thought you weren't allowed to have cameras when you were over there. Well, Nellie did march to the beat of her own drum a little bit. Um, mm. Yes, she took her own camera. And I'm glad that so many of the nurses and people took cameras because it gives us more of a personal insight into their war. This one as well, actually. Yes, that's when Nellie learned to swim at Lake Timsa. Oh. She wrote home to her uh, favourite niece, Peggy, and she said, I've learnt to swim now. When I get home, I'm going to teach you to swim. And she said that the water was so buoyant and so salty that you couldn't sink if you tried. Not only did she take her own camera, she even took a little dog tip with her. Now, I can understand tucking a camera away somewhere yeah. and hiding it, but how do you conceal a dog? But somehow she must have tucked it under a coat or whatever when she boarded the Kaiara. Mm. And so Tip went along to, at least to Cairo yeah. with her. So that must be Nellie in there as well, is it? That'd be Nellie. Mm. Yes. Um, and the orderlies. Yeah. And these are incredible, aren't they? Now, she didn't marry and she didn't have her own children, but she really loved her sister Linda's little girl, Peggy, and there are photos of her here as a little four-year-old, and um, she adored her. Yeah, so she did have a softer side as well. Of course she did. And while she was in Egypt, she bought a little doll, a porcelain doll, and she hand-stitched a World War I uniform for her. So can I see it? Only if you go to the War Memorial, because both the, the doll is there now and her medals are there. Oh, yes. wow, that would be incredible to have a look at. And there's an entry in Nellie's diary here too, written when she was in Egypt. The men were all go going off to war to fight and she said, it made me so sad to see them go and to know that they would soon be under fire. And where did they go after Egypt? Nellie volunteered to go to the Greek island of Lemnos. Lemnos happened to be just five hours across from Gallipoli. So that was a much shorter trip to make. It was also the area, of course, in Gallipoli, where uh, her cousins had all gone, many of them had gone to fight. Oh, OK, yes. so a lot of them, a lot of the Maurice's yes. ended up Well, at four Lemnos. of the 13 were there. Yeah. Now, Nellie's brother, Arthur, mm. as well as the cousins, William from Dalgetty and Walter from Mossvale and Maurice Chapman as well, all landed at, at Carba Tepe, which is now Anzac Cove, and Julius... Oh, okay who joined up with the British, mm. he landed at uh, Cape Hellas. And we are fortunate to have um, the diaries of Walter and Arthur wow. here, mm. and we have uh, the report written by Nellie, and it gives us a personal insight into their war. Mm. This uh, report of Arthur's is a very short one. He only wrote short entries each night, but as he still describes the horrors of war. He says things like, dead and wounded everywhere. And he describes the rigours of the combat with words such as, shot several Turks, I feel the want of sleep, eyes very tired. And there was always that ever-present danger that prompted him to record one night, I'm giving this diary to Walford to keep in case I get killed. Yeah, take this for me. Promise me you'll look after that for me. Let's go! Ah! 
Walter's take on the war is quite different. This is only part of his diary, but it's rather dark compared to Arthur's account. And there are a few quotes here that illustrate that point. And Walter, of course, was never far from the action. I had a pretty close call, had my only pipe broken clean in two by a bullet while smoking. It filled my eyes and mouth full of tobacco and gave me a great shock at first. And then he adds, eventually I got another pipe from a dead man. Oh my God. He had some strange thoughts and he does explain these attitudes a little further on saying, before coming here, I hated the idea of looking at a corpse and now I find them rather interesting and they have no effect on me. In some places, the dead bodies were as thick as melons in a melon patch. Just reading it sometimes makes me feel quite uncomfortable. Mm. Well, I guess it sort of shows that, like, Walter and Nellie would have seen a lot of death and they would have been so used to it. I guess it wouldn't be as shocking as it is to us even 100 years later. But what happened to them? Arthur's notes simply say, on the 30th of April 1915, which was really only five days after he'd arrived and landed there, I shot a Turk 30 yards from our guns, got wounded in both arms and a leg. I was taken on board B1 steamer at 11pm. Walter's description was a bit more matter-of-fact. He writes, There was a Turk up on the left. He must have been a bad shot, for although he was only 200 yards away, he nearly missed me. The bullet just went in on top and behind the left shoulder and out again without touching any bone. I thought some ass in the support trench behind had hit me with a stone <laughs> till the blood started trickling down my back. So very different accounts. And did Nellie know that that had happened to them, like what had been going on? Well, yes, she certainly knew, knew what happened to Arthur because she arrived back in Egypt from Lemnos just in time to be able to look after Arthur. So oh, she nursed her own brother. That's incredible. Um, she was um, the head sister at Gezira Palace Hospital where he was admitted. And Arthur wrote home about his sister's visits and he said, Nellie brought me tobacco and a toothbrush and I'm being well looked after. You can inch at all. There's just nowhere. You can't get your foothold. And here's a photo of him, Cairo, where he's uh, recovering and recuperating. That was from the wounds. And what about Walter? What happened to him after that? Well, Walter went on to fight in France mm. and then also to fight with the light horse in Palestine. And did Nellie say how she was feeling? Well, Nellie wrote home all the time and although her letters were very cheerful and brave, I think she was quite homesick because she's written in a letter here... I get a great big ache to go back to Australia sometimes, but I'm here for a while yet. Mm. And did she describe how the war was for her or, you know, the kinds of terrible conditions she would have endured? Well, she was really quite a private person and she didn't share her feelings much, but her first experience as a military nurse on Lemnos were very harsh and very difficult. We do have um, this very telling document here, written in her own hand. There's 23 pages of it. It was a report about how she found the hospitals and the conditions and the management of things while she was away. That was incredibly gutsy for a woman to speak out like that, wasn't it? It was meant really for official eyes, but being Nelly, of course, she pulled no punches and she said exactly um, what she had on her mind. And she writes, the first sight that met my gaze when going over to the hospital was some of the dysentery and jaundice patients. They were sitting on commodes outside the tent doors in the icy wind and sleet with no clothing but their pyjamas. They were doubled up with pain and passing blood and mucus. We're glad to see you. Don't worry, we'll fix you right up. Then on going inside the tents, I found these same patients sleeping on mattresses that were on the floor and the mattresses were just encased in mud. dressings off and find even their wounds were crawling with vermin. Oh, my goodness. Nellie was quite scathing. Why were things so bad? 
she said that the management got in the way of the nurses treating the wounds very promptly. The rules and regulations seemed to be altered every day and we had to muddle along the best we could. But her criticisms also extended to the military who were in charge of those hospitals. And so she writes, at times our presence was completely ignored by the officer, with the result that we had very little control over the orderlies. The officers seemed to want the orderly to know that they were quite satisfied with their work and that the nursing sisters were really quite unnecessary. And was that with the orderlies all being men as well? Yes, the orderlies were all men and they were treated as a class above the nurses. Yeah, wow. Even though they had no medical training. And this, of course, contributed to the problems that she found. I asked the orderly for a bundle of sterile dressing towels and he handed me some which I happened to know were not sterilised. So said, those will not do. The surgeon will need sterilised ones. The orderly said, never mind, sister, the captain won't be any the wiser. I never think to sterilise the towels for him and he never knows. Of course, I put this down to ignorance. He little knew the danger he was exposing the patients to. Mm, that's terrible. It is. Mm. But of course, when Nellie encountered problems like this, she set about straight away to solve those problems and sort out the situation. In a few days after our arrival, the men presented a very different appearance. They'd groomed themselves and had a wash, and I'm sure they felt better in consequence. It was little wonder that the men called the nurses the angels of the battlefields. Yeah, I've never well. heard any of this before. Like, it's quite interesting to get a little bit of an insight into Nellie's war. So it turns out that doing a research project on one person is a really hard job. It's like doing a giant jigsaw puzzle. So despite my best efforts, I haven't been able to find a member of Kitty's family that can tell me about her wartime experiences. The War Memorial holds all the artefacts and archives of Australia's military history. I'm not only hoping to find out more about Kitty, but also my great-grandfather, Reginald Francis McCrory. His service record says that although he was a driver by profession, he enlisted as an infantryman and later volunteered to be a stretcher bearer on the front line. He was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal for conspicuous gallantry. On October 1st, 1918, he carried wounded men from the field under very heavy shell fire. He was later discharged from service, having been wounded three times. Kitty was also mentioned in quite a few official documents. The local Milton newspaper revealed that she had looked after Percy Harrison, a local volunteer. Before the war, Percy had been a driver in the family business and had joined up in 1915, aged 24, and trained to be a machine gunner. In a postcard home from England in 1917, where he was recovering from malaria, he writes, I suffer with the blues a lot, and I'd rather be over there in France where, in spite of the mortal terrors at times, a man has a free swing. Percy did get a free swing, but sadly after being promoted to corporal and gassed, he was killed in action on September the 18th, 1918. He was one of the nine Milton boys who never came home. Returning to Kitty's story, I discovered something extraordinary, which confirmed what I was told in Milton. Not only was my great-grandfather a hero, so was Kitty. That was a really exciting day. I had such a great time. It's given me great insight into my great-grandfather and Kitty as well. Now I'm just going to run all this past an expert. So, Grandma, I know that my great-grandfather, so your dad, Reginald Francis, was awarded the DCM. That's right. Yeah, and it was saying that he was awarded it for conspicuous gallantry. That's right. We were talking about it and I said to him, why did you do it, Dad? And his answer to me was because I couldn't stand to hear our men calling for help. 
He never discussed it, but he bought a, a whole encyclopedia of the 1418 war uh, because he said, you want to know about it? I'll get it for you. He said, there it is. When he came back, was he, um, was he surrounded by a lot of the men in his battalion? Well, I'm going to be a bit flamboyant here, but it is the truth. Because he went on the, out on the field as a stretcher bearer when he didn't have to, mm. the men that he did bring in thought that he was Jesus Christ. He held that for all of his life, the respect of them. I hit a dead end on my research, so I went to meet author and historian Janet Butler, who has written extensively on World War I. So, Ashley, tell me how your research is going. It's going all right, actually. I've made a few discoveries uh, in regards to Kitty Porter in relation to Private Thomas White. I told Janet about my trips to Milton and Canberra and my discovery there. I thought that the RRC may relate to the story of Tom White from South Australia, champion rower who volunteered to take the oars of one of the Australian boats in the second wave to hit the beach at Gallipoli under heavy gunfire. According to his mate, Arthur Blackburn, Tom was wounded as they reached the shore. He was taken on board the hospital ship HMAT Gascon where a nurse called Kitty Porter tended to him until he passed. She wrote home to his fiancée, Eileen Champion. I remember Private Tom White very well. Everything possible was done for him. It was knowing that he was engaged made me stay on duty a little longer to be what comfort I could to him. I know how you feel, as I too am engaged. However, there is nowhere on the records that I can find where Kitty actually is engaged. Yeah, so I just need a little bit of help there. Actually, there were two Kitty Porters who went to war and served in the nursing service. What? How is that possible? Actually, as you know from your visit to the Sydney Hospital, there were two Kitty Porters who trained there at the same time. Yeah. Both nurses then went on and served in the war. And I think that's a source of the confusion that you have, a mix-up of their names. And I think that you'll find the answer is to go back to the embarkation mm. records, so then you'll know which Kitty Porter it was that was on the Gascon. And you also need to look at the marital mm. status. Janet was right. The service records show that Catherine Minnie Porter left on the Kiara with the first nursing contingent on November the 28th, 1914. However, Catherine Lawrence Porter only signed up in March 1915 and didn't leave Australia until April 3rd. The voyage to Egypt took about a month, so she couldn't have been aboard the Gascon when Tom White was taken aboard. While there is no record of Kitty being engaged, Minnie's service record confirms that she was in a relationship with Captain John Donaldson of the 19th Infantry Battalion. It's not known whether they met at Sydney Hospital where Minnie and Kitty trained and he was a doctor, or in Egypt where she nursed him. But before leaving for France, he made a will leaving everything to her. They were married a few months later on the 8th of July 1916, but their joy was short-lived. Donaldson was badly wounded at the Battle of Pozieres on July 26 and was taken to the number one Red Cross hospital at Le Torquay. On receiving the news, Minnie requested leave to be with him. Thank you. 
John Donaldson died on August 11th, 1916, and was buried at the military cemetery at Le Taple. Despite being widowed, married nurses weren't allowed on active duty. Minnie was struck off strength and sent back to Australia. The service records also reveal the confusion that the two kiddies caused the war office. Kitty's parents received a letter saying that their daughter was married and would be returning home, a claim that Kitty's family challenged. The department replied that a Kitty Porter was coming home and they would let them know which one it was when the ship arrived. An apologetic letter from the matron-in-chief of the Army Nursing Service explained that the mix-up was due to there being two Catherine Porters in service. Bravely, Minnie re-enlisted under her married name and returned to Egypt, where she served until the end of the war. After the end of the Gallipoli campaign in 1916, the Australian forces were redeployed from Turkey to Europe. I've come to the War Memorial in Canberra to find out a little bit more about Nellie's war in Europe. In their archives are letters and a logbook Nellie used to record her observations of the war, along with photographs and memorabilia from her long and distinguished career. My first stop was the doll that Nellie made for her niece, Peggy McInnes, while serving in Egypt. I learned from the letter she sent with it that she was called the Sister Helen doll. Lots of love and a great big kiss to my darling Peg from Auntie Nell. I want you to call the doll Sister Helen as that's what Mummy always calls Auntie Nell. The many battles that made up the bloody and destructive Somme campaign of 1917 and 18 were named after the small towns and villages they were fought in. There are reminders everywhere, in the red brick used to rebuild historic buildings, the monuments to the civilians lost in the pitiless eye of the storm, and the graveyards that give some sense of scale to the huge numbers that perished. The Australian contribution is well remembered in places like Vos or Somme, where the German ace, the Red Baron, was brought down in a muddy field. But perhaps most keenly felt in Villiers Breton Nord, where the Australians halted the German spring offensive of 1918. Victory came at a great cost, with 1,200 killed in the action. Nellie nursed in England before being transferred to France in 1917, where she joined the 3rd Australian General Hospital in Abbeville. It was one of the main casualty clearing stations during the Somme campaign. Her service record reveals that Nellie was looking after men who'd been gassed, which must have been really challenging work. The third AGH casualty reports indicate the terrific pressure the nurses were under. In March 1918 alone, they received 2,048 cases and operated on 563. The character of the cases has been most severe it has been necessary to keep the operating theatres going day and night. In June, there had been 1,868 patients, and the report admits the nurses had been rather heavily taxed. When the fighting got too near Abbeville, Nellie was sent north to the 25th General Hospital in the seaside town of Hardelo Plage. Based in this row of residential houses with additional tents on the beach, 
This 4,500 bed hospital cared for those who had suffered serious burns. Her diary entries speak of medical procedures and the facilities, but betray nothing of her thoughts and feelings in what must have been the most difficult of times. However, I did find one personal item, an autograph book full of drawings, cartoons, and dedications from those she nursed and served with. She was clearly held in very high esteem. I also discovered that she was awarded the Royal Red Cross, second class, in recognition of her valuable service to the armies in France and Flanders. She marked the occasion with a modest diary note. Seventh of the sixth, 18. List of birthday honours came out, my name being on the list for an RRC. I was just beginning to think that Nellie was one of the lucky ones who came through the war unscathed when I found something very surprising in her service record. On returning to Australia after the war, she was declared MU, or medically unfit, and discharged from duty. However, these photographs taken with her parents shortly after her arrival home betray no hint of crisis. I left Canberra with some answers, but still more questions. I do think Nellie's experiences in France and Gallipoli would have had an effect on her, and I'd like to find out a little bit more about her day-to-day -day lives in a frontline hospital. I've come to Sydney's Powerhouse Museum to meet Damien MacDonald, who curated an exhibition on the technological innovations in World War I. World War I was really the first big technological war. Everything ended up getting thrown at it. So we had aircraft, we had large-scale machine guns, artillery uh, that had never been seen. There was a million tonnes of artillery dropped on troops in World War I. So let's have a look yeah. at some of the artefacts. That so. is not what I thought was going to be under here. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Maxim gun. So the Maxim gun was really the first machine gun. This will just do continuous fire. Wow. Now these two items here, quite nasty. Yeah. So these are grenades. Mm -hmm. um, they were called bombs. They were called hand-thrown bombs. The word grenade came a little bit later. OK. So these are things that Nellie would have been very familiar with seeing in her time and, I guess, dealing with the other end of it, the damage exactly. that they caused. Look at that. That's a little bit more along the lines of what I was expecting to find, actually. Now, these are some of the, uh, the health and medicine innovations okay. that, were, uh, that were born out of World War I. This object here... What this, is this? So that's a prosthetic arm. Now, in World War I, there was actually quite a high survival rate. One of the reasons for that was amputation, and a clean wound had a much better chance of uh, healing mm. without infection. Wow. So lots of men returned from the war, uh, without limbs. Mm. One of the major innovations of World War I in the area of health and medicine was X-ray. The technology of X-ray was only about 20 years old. Mm. So, as you can see, that's a glass plate negative that X-ray. That's or... right. Well, that's a that's an elbow. Oh, when I look at her diary, she never seems to mention any of this. It's all quite casual and it's quite light when she's writing back to her family as well. And I know that she was medically discharged. Can you tell me a little bit of the kinds of things nurses would have had to experience during their time in the war? Uh, there's all this technology going on, but the technology couldn't keep up with the injuries. A nurse that, that was uh, nursing in, in a domestic situation mm. um, would have been completely unprepared for the sort yeah. of things that they would have seen. And there was a little little place called the pantry where nurses could go. Uh, it's just a tiny room. They'd lock themselves in there to try and compose themselves. Really? Because the attitude was that they had to be professional and they mm. couldn't show emotion in front of the men. It would have, wouldn't have taken long for them to be able to look at a type of wound and realise that that man wasn't going to survive. Mm. When the surgeons knew that there was a young man that was really beyond saving, um, he would be taken to the dying ward. And, of course, nurses had to sit with those mm. young men while they passed away. Mm. Uh, that's a lot for someone to take in. Mm. There was there was censors, so they couldn't write home about what was what was what they were going through, right. um, okay. and they couldn't really record it in their diaries yeah. either. 
Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of taking it on yourself. In the same way that these men were coming back from the war and dealing with, you know, losing a limb or having to live life differently, I hadn't quite thought that nurses would have done the exact same thing. It's just all the damage would have been done um, psychologically. Psychologically, yeah. absolutely. So the revelation that there were two kitty porters really took me by surprise. However, it's also intrigued me more. So I'm going back to Janet to find out more about Kitty Porter's efforts during the war. I know that you were disappointed when you found that your Kitty Porter wasn't the Kitty Porter who was involved in looking after Tom White, but she, in her own way, as did all the nurses, had quite an amazing time. When she gets to Egypt, mm -hmm. she's attached to the First Australian General Hospital, which is readying for all the wounded from Gallipoli. And because the numbers are overwhelming, then they take over um, an amusement park, Luna Park, which was the same as the Luna Park in Sydney and in Melbourne. Yeah. And they, they turn the skating rink into a ward and the ticket office into um, an operating theatre. Wow. And that's where Kitty Porter went. But what they were faced with in Egypt was absolutely overwhelming numbers. The hospital that she was at um, looked after 12,000 patients while they were there. And they had some difficulties, the Australian nurses, because they were honorary officers, which means that they didn't actually have rank, which meant that when they gave the male orderlies an instruction, um, the male orderlies would sometimes be perhaps quite rude back. Orderly, can I get some clean bandages? Bugger off. This wasn't a time where women gave men instructions. Mm. There was an upside. Nurses, the Australian nurses, have particularly very restricted lives at home. So when they came to Egypt and they entered a kind of social world, they were taken out on motor rides to view the pyramids by moonlight and they oh, were <laughs> taken out to, to dinner. It was like something out of the Arabian Nights for them. And they seized the day. They really did. Kitty Porter went down to Luxor um, with three friends. This image was taken outside a hotel in Aswan, and the note on the back says, We still have some fine gallops and some races on donkeys here. They have christened us the quartet. I flatter myself that you would recognise me at the end in the Panama hat. I wish you could have visited some of the places with us. They're trying to write home to their families the good things. Yeah. They're not telling them about, you know, the conditions in the hospital, the conditions of the wounded, and reflecting their kind of modesty, because she says to her family, the only downside is I wish my people were there, that she wanted her family to be sharing this experience. And you can see the way the nurses from this restricted life at home, the long working hours, um, the very low pay that would never have allowed them to come overseas like this, yeah. they embrace everything. Really, this time in Egypt was kind of like the last light before the darkness for them. When Gallipoli was evacuated, all the soldiers came back to Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, the army was reorganised and expanded and were ready to be sent to France. And the nurses from um, the first Australian general and the second Australian general went with them. In Egypt, what they were faced with was disease from Gallipoli and gunshot wounds. Yeah. On the Western Front, they were going to come up against high explosive shell wounds, often multiple wounds, and nothing would have prepared them for that. In mid-1917, a decision was made to gather all of the Australian nurses in British hospitals into three. The first day of the song was the 1st of July. It was not that far away. They were preparing for it. Mm. And so they said to the 1st Australian General Hospital, it's set up at Ruin on the race course. prepared for the 
the overwhelming numbers coming in that were incredibly severely wounded. That first day of the Somme still has 58,000 men became casualties mm. and it's still the record to this day. Um, and they, they never expected that amount of casualties to be flooding in and they were working around the clock mm. in all of the hospitals. So they were coming in often with multiple wounds. In the clearing stations, they would lift men onto the operating theatres with 10 wounds. Um, they were coming in um, in shock. Um, as one nurse said, stone cold and pulseless. So the kind of wounds they were facing were really confronting. Mm. And the levels of death, of course, were going up. They had the young men, you know, dying in their arms. That's horrific and gruesome. She was at Ruin. She was lent to a hospital train. Now, the, the hospital trains and the clearing stations were as close as a nurse could possibly get to the front. Yeah. And that's what they wanted. They wanted... They had to fight for the right to go to war. Um, war was still a man's domain. Um, there are a lot of, of senior officers in the Australian Army and the British Army who didn't want nurses there at all because they could... They were used to having trained male okay. orderlies. <laughs> OK. They very quickly discovered that the nurses made an enormous difference, which is why the nurses started to, to work in more forward hospitals. And so they put them on the ambulance trains, which went up to the clearing station to collect the wounded and bring them back down. So she was working on those ambulance trains during the Somme emergency. She was one of three nurses on each train. There had to be a particular kind of nurse. The staffs are small and no semi-trained nurses were allowed to work in them. But it was very testing work. It would take two hours once they got up to the front to load all of the wounded. It was a very slow journey back because the reality of the war was that the wounded had the lowest priority. Um, they had to make way for the supply trains, for the troop trains, so they had to pull to, onto sidings to let them go by. They couldn't operate on board. They had to offload the wounded. And it, was, it took a long time to get back to base. So people were dying of shock on board, um, dying of shell wounds. Um, and the nurses themselves in those situations where they were very crowded, they, they'd be in charge of a, a carriage where there was, say, three tiers of wounded um, stretcher cases. Yeah. There were often stretchers on the floor. They'd learn how to walk on the side of the, the stretchers to get around. Mm. Some intrepid Australian nurses in the old ambulance trains, um, if they had to get to another ward, another carriage, there was no corridor. So they'd do what was called footboarding mm. and go outside with a bag on their back um, with stimulants and bandages and so on. And an orderly would grab their hand and they'd they go on to another carriage. It was very dangerous because mm. one orderly actually fell and lost both of his legs and they told the nurses they weren't to do that anymore, but the nurses said, well, how are we going to get to the wounded men? Yeah, wow. And it was dangerous. When they got to the front, um, there was shelling. Um, they sometimes had to turn the lights off on the ambulance trains and wait until the, the bombings had stopped. Lights out! been quite an amazing experience and she does say in one of her letters I hate to see the men wounded but if they're going to be wounded I hope on, I'm on the train with them because it's where they felt um, that's where they wanted to be they wanted to be as close to the boys as possible as close to the boys being wounded as possible so they could actually make a real difference, difference. so on the 22nd of the 3rd of 1918, Kitty was sent to the 53rd um, Casualty Clearing Station, which was at Roy. They were exposed, camped in a clump of trees in this field to the south of the town. They were in danger. Mm. Um, the clearing stations were shelled. Often they'd um, move them too close to the front, so they're next to ammunition dumps. When she got there, she would have been sort of under no illusions that this, this was not a, a safe situation. What actually happened just as she got there is that the day before, the Germans launched a major offensive. Take 
They were nearly captured. The nurses had to be got out so quickly, and so did Kitty Porter. And amongst that luggage, of course, was her diary, which we would really dearly love to have. Oh, no. For her work there in evacuating the wounded, she was mentioned in dispatches for gallantry in the field by um, General Sir Douglas Haig. Really? Wow. I think that you can see from her work on the ambulance trains and particularly at Roy that her service was as remarkable as the nurses on the Gascon. Duty officer. Urgent signal. Where's the officer? Please. Sir, yes. from division. It's official. It's over. He's right. The war is over. <laughs> When the war was over, when the armistice was declared in November, the nurses' work was still going on because, of course, the Spanish influenza hit and they were seeing boys, of course, that had fought all the way through the war and were succumbing to the flu. And when all of that work was done, they were transferred to England and most of the nurses were, were sent home working. They had to work their passage home and so that's how she came back to Australia. I was intrigued to find out what happened to Nellie and the 12 other Maurices after the war. I arranged to meet Mabs in Sutton Forest, a small town near the family home at Ealing Forest. It's a beautiful place, isn't it? Come with me, I've got something to show you. Yeah. Now, many of the Maurice ancestors are buried here mm. in All Saints Sutton Forest. This is John Maurice's grave and Jane Maurice. Yeah. They were the ones who established Ealing Forest. The Maurice family have worshipped here for generations and inside was a special memorial to those who served in the Great War. Here's our World War I honour board. How did that actually get in here? Oh, it was put up by public subscription, I imagine, by people from the area. And I can see there's only eight of them up there. Was that all of them who went to war? Or? Not at all. Yeah. There were 13 cousins. Those eight represent the Maurices who lived in this district mm. at the time. Did they all survive? No, sadly. They didn't all survive. Arthur Maurice, who had been badly injured, he was actually evacuated home. But Glenn Harriet, Maurice, he went on to fight in Peron and in September 1918, just before the war ended, he was killed. Walter Maurice, he was injured twice while he was at Gallipoli and then went on to the Western Front and in the Western Front injured another couple of times. Mm. Finally, he went to fight in Palestine and he was fatally shot there. Oh, poor Walter. He was such a character as well. And, and what about Nellie? Would you say that the four years at war took a toll on her at all? Well, of course, yes. And she was... When she got back to Australia, she was deemed medically unfit. Did that stop her or...? Stop her? Good gracious, no. There was no stopping Nellie. She was a force of nature. This is where Kitty landed when she arrived back in Australia aboard the appropriately named Medic in June 1919. This is Sydney's North Head Quarantine Station, where passengers arriving with infectious diseases were treated for over 150 years. Kitty's last act of military service was to nurse soldiers suffering from influenza on the passage home. Her military service record shows that she was discharged shortly afterwards. From North Head, she travelled a short distance south to the suburb of Randwick, where I've arranged to meet Claire, a descendant of Kitty's. Hi there, Claire. Hi. Nice Hi. to Hi. meet Hi. you. Nice to meet you. 
So you have a connection with Kitty? Yes, I do. I'm her uh, Kitty's niece. Mm -hmm. My father was Harry Porter, Kitty's brother, and they came from a very large family of 13 children. Wow, OK. And my father was number 12 oh. of 13. <laughs> yes, yeah, so very So late. he was uh, 12 years younger than Kitty. I have a, um, a photo of the transport ship medic, mm -hmm. which was signed by a lot of uh, friends and uh, possibly crew members. Mm -hmm. And she then went down to her hometown of Milton on the south coast, where she was given a, a wonderful reception oh, okay. uh, by nice. the townspeople at the Milton Town Hall. And this is a photo of Kitty, we think taken um, possibly after she came back from the war and may have been when she had the reception at the Milton Town Hall. So you asked me to meet you in this place, but uh, what is this place and what's its connection to Kitty? Ashley, this is the site of the old Randwick Military Hospital. And oh, OK. The, uh, this site is very significant in the story of Kitty Porter. It was um, to hear that um, she was appointed matron after Was her, she? Yeah, oh, when she was, okay. When she was released from the services, she was told that she had been given the uh, position matron. Oh, nice. That's, oh, but, that's nice. Yes. Oh. <laughs> but, during, but during her three weeks leave in the Milton district, she unfortunately contracted the Spanish flu or the influenza that she oh, had worked for been... four years in uh, France, surrounded by this nurse soldiers, back to hell, but there was no cure. Mm. And um, so she was brought back to here as a patient. Oh. Not as a matron. He makes me lie down by green pastures. My, my green father green was only a young man and he was allowed to come up to the hospital, although it was not, he was not supposed to. They allowed him to visit her. They put a gown and mask on him and he was allowed to spend time with her. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. And she was nursed by two very good friends who had trained with her, been to war with her. So sad it has to end like this. I want to read the 23rd Psalm to you. The Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd. But um, sadly, she passed away on the 17th of July, 1919. Oh, wow. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful person who has sacrificed herself <laughs> to help and save so many others. And we have here a copy of her death certificate. Yeah, she's only 35. Very young. After all she had seen and been through, it, it was quite, quite a blow. I'm pretty shocked. I am. I've just been on this, you know, journey of learning and discovering about this one person. You kind of get emotionally invested and then find out that. That's pretty, it's pretty gut-wrenching. Actually, this is where Kitty was buried, at the beautiful Waverley Cemetery overlooking the ocean in Sydney. Kitty herself was given a full military funeral, and in 1919, that had never been afforded to any woman. Had Kitty lived just a little longer, she would have known that she had been awarded the Royal Red Cross, second class. 
for her efforts in um, the evacuation of soldiers when the hospital was uh, bombed and they were able to evacuate and get all the people out. The honour of the medal was gazetted in England in 1918, but unfortunately it took uh, more than six months to filter through to Australia. So by the time it reached Australia, Kitty had passed away. And the military then sent a letter to Kitty's family for the medal to be collected at Milton at the town hall. And um, her family gave my father the honour of doing this on their behalf. But I really think that it would have been a very proud moment for him. So is the medal still in the family? But it's not in Australia. Oh, God, no. The fates were not kind to Kitty. It was cruel, almost. She was awarded the Royal Red Cross and she was not given it, and but she was awarded... Oh, I don't know. This is... It was really emotional. It was all a lot to handle and... Yeah, quite sad, really. Mm. A poem was written in Kitty's memory entitled The Angel of Milton. The final verse reads, God gave her peace, he took her home, and did it all in love. She's happy now, in perfect rest, safe in heaven above. Hi, you must be there. Did you come in? Nice to be Elizabeth. Yes, nice to meet you. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> come on, Stuart. Thank you. Oh, this is quite an interesting vase you've got here. That is an interesting vase. Yeah. It's actually a World War I shell case. Really? Oh. Yes, made or beaten out for Auntie Nell. It's it's a lovely, lovely piece. Mm. And I've got some other things to show you as mm. well that you might I'll not be that. aware of. So please come yeah. on this way and we'll go and have a look. This is something that's very special and very precious and you can see for yourself what it is. It's the Christmas card that she sent from Lemnos to the family in 1915. It's quite funny getting that Christmas card because I, I can imagine there wouldn't have been a lot to celebrate. Think about sending Christmas cards from a place like that in a time like that. I think it speaks for itself, doesn't it? So what relation are you then to Nellie? She was my great aunt and she was also my godmother. She was my father's aunt and his mother's sister, if you can work that out. So yes, she was my great aunt. OK, so this is a photo I was telling you about with Auntie Nell when she was a matron of George's Heights Military Hospital, which is at Mossman in Sydney. It was rehab and burns and general care of, of wounded soldiers brought back and um, amputees. We saw this the other day, actually, when oh, we went yes, well, in that, that little room. Yeah, yeah exactly. that was... Yeah. There was that book. That was the one that I provided, that Wow, franchise. that's incredible. It honestly just felt like you'd sort of gone back in time mm. um, and you got to go through and see these original buildings. It was just incredible. Mm. I hadn't seen anything like no. that, especially no. not in the Sydney region. So it was really special to be able to look at that and, mm. and to go through those halls and, and photos like this, like the ones you provided, really helped you... Um, feel yes, what it would have looked yeah. like? No, no, it was a great place and a beautiful location. So while we're actually um, looking around the museum, we found something that I thought you'd be quite interested in. So I've got it right here. Just, here we go. Oh, good heavens, no. I have certainly haven't seen that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that looks like her in her cape, mm. I presume. So this was just hanging on the wall when we walked in. We recognised Nellie in it straight away. I mean, she's got such a distinctive yes. nose and, and her hairstyle. Yes. But it was really exciting because I don't think a lot no, of us have no. seen this photo no, I yet. I didn't see that. After George's Heights, Nellie joined the Bush Nursing Association. What did they do? A lot of women, most women would have given birth at home, particularly in regional and country areas. 
And even if there was a hospital, it might have been too hard to get to, too far or whatever. And so the bush nurses worked in that capacity, um, bringing the care to mothers and babies and also to infants. In 1934, she was appointed to, as a member of the British Empire, so she received an MBE for her work, not in the war, but with the Bush Nursing Association. So she'd obviously done quite a lot to, to grow that organisation. So the other day, we actually went to Ellis Street, where she would have lived. Would you have spent any time there with oh, Nellie? Indeed. Did you? Yeah. Uh, well, she used to look after me if my parents went out. Mum said I was about three or four, and I was four in that photo, taken on the Hawkesbury. So that would have been, OK, I shall tell you, 1951. When we actually went and um, spoke to Jeremy, he was saying his mum, who lived with her, mm. found her quite strict. Is that... Was that your experience with Nellie? I guess she was strict. But then I think about what she did, and she had to be strict. She was in a position of authority, you know, from early times, particularly with the war, our head sister, etc., etc. She had to be able to control um, medical orderlies who knew nothing of medicine but were praised to the heavens by the doctors or by the officers who didn't want the women there. She had to also look after the patients, look after her staff. Let's put it this way, I never felt uncomfortable with her. I, lo I do remember that I loved spending time with her. She'd read stories to me. There was one particular book that we both loved. It's a first edition book. It was printed in 1916. And there is one particular poem, but it's a poem called Good Night, Daddy, at the War. And it was very moving. And I, my mother said to me quite some time later, when I was old enough probably to realise, that she and Dad came home to find both Auntie Nell and me bawling our eyes out oh. because of, as she'd read that story. And um, to me, the fact that, what, over 30 years afterwards, this could still affect her in the way that it did. So I think that says something about she may have seen, been strict on the outside, but very different on the inside. Good night, good night, Daddy at the war. I'm standing in the starlight here beside the shore. Here I salute you, now the day is done. You far off salute me, your little soldier son. Good night, good night. When we said goodbye, we promised one another, Daddy, you and I, you to pray, God bless you every night for me. I, God bless my Daddy far across the sea. Good night, good night, Daddy, come home soon. It's lonely for a sentry here beneath the moon. I miss you, I miss you, now the day is o'er. I'm longing to kiss you, Daddy at the war. Yes, <laughs> again, very moving, even after all those years. So when I found out that Kitty didn't actually survive, it was a massive shock. I was really... I was, I was quite heartbroken, actually. Um, but it got me thinking as to what happened to the other Kitty. So I decided to do a little bit of research because she had lost her husband as well, and I wanted to see uh, where she went from there on. Minnie Kate's service record shows that she survived the war and, like the other Kitty, was awarded the Royal Red Cross second class. On returning to Australia, she came to the Sydney suburb of Wurunga, where her husband John came from. He had lived on this street with his brothers Charles and George. All three went to war. Charles was killed at Gallipoli in 1915, John in France in 1916, and George was discharged after being wounded five times and earning the Military Cross for gallantry. In keeping with this really lovely story, Minnie Kate actually married John's brother George in 1925, and from all accounts, it seems like they had a really happy and long marriage. In 1955, Minnie Kate passed away. Uh, she was 74 years old. To me, it seems fitting that she and her two husbands are remembered on the Warunga War Memorial, thrown together by the cruelest of fates, but here together forevermore. This was such a wonderful and beautiful story. It's, you couldn't make this stuff up. And I'm so glad that one of them had such a happy ending.
But this incredible story was not over yet. There was one more amazing twist. Lovely to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you Thank too. Thank you for coming out. Yeah. <laughs> Hi there, there, I'm Ashley. Hello. 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 Nice to meet you. Hi, Margaret. Hi, Margaret. So what's the exciting news that I had to come around for? Well, I think there are quite a few surprises in store for you. Does this have to do with the box? Most no, certainly does. Yeah. Would you like to open it, Ashley? Yes, I would. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. That is um, from a memorial thing out to do with the HMS medic that she came back on um, to Australia. Um, and actually on that ship, she was still nursing the, um, the soldiers when she came over. Oh my gosh, she would have been sick at this point too. They were given to my aunt who lived in America for several years. And she posted, I asked for any um, photos of my father actually. and. Um, she sent the photos of my father plus, plus this, um, all this memorabilia of kitties. So they'd been, they'd been in Australia for probably about 11 years now and nobody knew that they were here. That is the Royal Red Cross medal. Like, that was hers? That was hers, yes. Oh, my God. Actually, that, that's the medal that my father uh, collected on behalf of his family at the Milton uh, Town Hall. And Unbelievable. It's wonderful to have it back in Australia where yes. it belongs. Well, that's great. That is very unusual for the king to write a, um, a personal note. Generally, they're just type letters, um, not in the King's handwriting. The Queen and I wish you Godspeed, a safe return to happiness and joy of home life with early restoration to health, a grateful mother country, thanks for your faithful services. Wow. That shows how special Kitty was, that he bothered to do that. How do you feel now about, about the story? Is it sort of um, uplifting for you to have ended it this way? It is. I'm really trying not to cry. <laughs> That's all right. I do all the time. <laughs> um, hmm. It's shocking in, in a good way. Yes. It's... Yes. Imagine the emotional Astounding. Yeah. Mm. Like you've been on this complete... Yes, you, you've never been on, I don't, on, on, the, on the whole journey. I'm not even related to her, and it's, I yeah. feel like I yeah. personally know her. That's and right. <laughs> I feel now that the story of a friend has sort of come to, come a, to, to an a end. Come to an end. Yes. Come full circle, I suppose. Yes, that's mm. right. It's fantastic. You may think you've heard everything, but there's still one more thing to relate. On March 9th, 1918, while stationed at the 25th General Hospital in the French seaside town of Hardelot Plage, Kitty Porter made a will. It was witnessed by the matron, Maud Kellett, and the head sister, Nellie Maurice. Now, our story is told. 